pleasure to welcome you uh, one more time on behalf of the University of Split and the Polo by the European University of the Sea. It's a pleasure to come here and uh, feel this good energy. Uh, it's good to me that we <laughs> have a good time, but, and I'm really very much looking forward to hearing your presentations now. And uh, I really hope that uh, you enjoyed the whole week, uh, that you enjoyed meeting each other, and that uh, you know these connections will remain in the future. For us, uh, this is not just one event, it is very important, but we would also like to build the blue community of uh, blue PhDs, the community of tomorrow, where you will be in contact, not just with all the colleagues and the different doctoral studies collected in marine maritime and marine sciences, but also to other researchers, to alumni of our doctoral studies programs, and also to companies. And in this way, for this community that we are building, that you will always be able to hear what are the problems of the companies, and maybe some of you will continue to find it very interesting to try to solve this problem, whether as a researcher at the university or as you know, going back and joining some of these companies in the future and working together to develop some innovative products and services and solving many of the important environmental issues that I know that are very much close to heart for many of you. And I think that together in such a community, we are closer to reaching such a goal. So I hope uh, you, you will continue with use this method in some of the instances, but also be very open to learning other methods and now even more confidence in your ability to tackle complex problems. So, so I'm looking forward to the meeting and let's all keep in touch. Thank you very much. So how many of you are English masters now? Oh, let's see your hand. No English masters. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. The idea is as I said yesterday, uh, to get you empowered so that you can think in a way that is solving problems. The tools don't matter. The you is the important part, you know. So uh, this kind of cooperation together, I hope that you like cooperating together and working with different disciplines. This is a part that we want to uh, uh, build on, and we will invite you and use your uh, contacts to try to establish a network so that all of you can be in touch after the event ends. Uh, so, I'm, I would like to invite the first group. So, we did this semi randomly, and the first group on my list is group number three. <laughs> so the group number three is working on a problem from a company stable RC. Okay, good morning from our side. Uh, my name is Joanna and uh, this is Gucci from France. Uh, Tomasz from Poland, Tina from here in Croatia, Beate from Poland as well, and Lucia from Spain. Um, and yeah, we first want to say a big thank you for the organizers here in Split who made this very nice uh, workshop. I think we all learned a lot this week. And uh, we also want to say thank you to Josip uh, from uh, Sailboat RC, who was a very nice host and uh, took us yesterday uh, through his uh, company and gave us a lot of good insights. And um, yeah, I first want to start by presenting the problem we work on. So um, it's the problem of uh, Sailboat RC, uh, who is um, a company that is building um, sailboats, small sailboats, one meter long, that uh, you cannot really get into, but uh, you control them by remote control. And um, it was very interesting for me to learn that there are actually uh, international races with such boats. Uh, there's even a world championship, and uh, the world champions, uh, the current world champions, are from here in Croatia, uh, from Sebo RC. And um, yeah, the problem that, uh, the first problem that they presented to us um, is a problem that they have during uh, competitions, because uh, the competitions are structured in a way where they are racing for about 15 minutes, then there's a break of another 15 minutes, and they have to race again. Um, and this happens several times uh, during the day, and competitions at high level can last up to seven days. And during the race, the skipper who is guiding uh, the boat has to be very, very focused, 
he has to think about many things at the same time. He has to repeat uh, wind conditions in his head. He has to plan a strategy um, to decide when it's best to attack um, or maybe not. And at the same time, the wind conditions are changing very, very fast. So he has to be very, very focused. So he has to be in um, what here called a high mode, a very focused mode. But then um, in the break, of course, after one race is finished, um, the person is secretly relaxing and is going into a low mode. And um, what is difficult for the skipper then, when the next race starts, is to go very fast into the high mode so that um, at the start of the race, which is very important, he's already very focused and uh, doesn't need um, like the first five minutes of the race to get into the focus mode. So this is a problem that we are working on, or we worked on, and we came up uh, with a three-step strategy that we want to present. That consists of, first of all, training um, during competitions so that uh, the skipper is not just uh, physically fit, but most importantly, mentally fit uh, the entire time. Then uh, we work on the actual problems of the restaurant transitions between race and breaks. And um, yeah, the third step is then feedback to assess uh, how good the suggestions we have are and um, to improve uh, the methods we have. So, uh, for the first method, which is uh, training for the race, I want to uh, give you back the microphone. Thank you, Jack. Uh, so the first thing is training before competition. Uh, it contains of brain learning action, which is usually in uh, The first is mental training, which contains uh, memorizing, Sudoku, and for example, chess, uh, which can also have uh, in strategy thinking. And uh, also a meditation can be a good solution. And the second thing is diet, which is very important for our organism. And the uh, diet contains many nutrients, like for example, uh, fatty acids from fish, and also uh, fatty vitamins from vegetables and foods, uh, and uh, magnesium, which is very important for the nervous system. And um, Chocolate, and that's the best combination for uh, one museum, uh, and uh, can give the best results. Uh, also, the third thing is, of course, physical training, uh, which contains of high intensity training, and uh, cardio training, cycling, which can improve cardiovascular system. Uh, also, uh, for our point of view, uh, team games, for example, basketball, football, um, and others. Uh, can help uh, with, uh, with, for example, uh, strategy thinking, uh, reflex, uh, which is also very important in the competitions. And that's all which we uh, propose before competitions. Now, moving uh, to the competition, so during um, competition days, um, so we have, like I said, the transitions between race and races, and there we have uh, two options that we're proposing and um, we'd like to compare. Uh, the first idea is to stay in the high energy mode uh, the entire time. And of course, ideally, that would look something like the green line here. Um, so we have um, the time of the exact system energy here and races and breaks and race breaks. And in the ideal world, uh, the skipper would be the entire time from the entire day in a high energy mode. Uh, but of course, this is not realistic. And in reality, um, with time, the energy levels and concentration goes down. But um, what we were thinking is that maybe um, one could check if the games that are made in the beginning by being very focused at the beginning of the first races maybe outweigh uh, the losses towards the end, especially since uh, we've learned that uh, there's one that, uh, can, for which you can raise the result. So suggestions for the skipper to stay the entire break in high energy mode um, were, for example, to use virtual reality glasses um, that you can put in uh, on and um, that would simulate uh, a race further. So that by the time the start of the race uh, comes, he's already still racing and, and prepared. And um, other ideas would be the use of LED glasses, uh, like the ones provided by company Osram, who have already been used, for example, in uh, car racing, in these 24-hour races. Um, 
by the drivers of the BMW company or um, by Olympic athletes to get over jet lag um, in competitions. And the way they work is that uh, they change the intensity and the color of light to basically keep you awake or, or keep you in an energ energetic state. And uh, because this is obviously uh, very demanding uh, on the skipper, and the competition, like I said, can last for um, up to seven days, we are also suggesting a magnetic mattress for the night, uh, because the magnetic mattress can improve blood flow and oxygen levels, and um, yeah, therefore can help uh, to have a deeper sleep. Then our second option um, is skipping um, this uh, change, racing and break. Um, it's yeah, basically a partial excess section in, in terms of uh, trees parameter. And um, the idea here is that instead of, um, of having this uh, draw and then trying to go um, right at the start of the race into the high mode, um, what we find is something that's hopefully closer to the ideality. The ideality is again here shown in green, um, to go from the high mode very, very quickly, directly into a low mode, stay the entire break and rest in the low mode, and then immediately when the race starts, uh, go into the high mode. Again, this is obviously not uh, realistic, but um, we are suggesting um, meditation in the first place so that um, the skipper is going from high mode very quickly into a low mode. Then during the uh, low mode, uh, we suggest about five minutes of uh, relaxation, again, using uh, the mattress with magnets so that uh, the skipper gets uh, a bit of rest. And at the same time, uh, we're suggesting power bars or other uh, high sugar foods uh, to, keep, uh, to give you uh, energy. And then the most important part is we suggested now five minutes before a race start that uh, the skipper is again putting on the virtual reality glasses. So uh, he is already starting to race, um, in his set at least, before uh, an actual race start, and he is prepared for the start um, when the start counts. And um, of course, this is now just a suggestion, and it requires a lot of um, probably adjustment and measuring. So the first step in our plan is measuring, so getting feedback. Um, and yes, this can be achieved uh, through the use of several devices, like um, a smartwatch that is monitoring things like heart rate, uh, the oxygen saturation, also the stress level of the sleeper, um, so things like sleep quality. Um, at the same time, of course, we are interested in the results for the different methods that we're proposing. So which method overall during the, the competition is getting um, the most, uh, the best results. And um, we were also uh, suggesting to monitor maybe the brain activity of the skipper during competition um, to have yeah, more um, better data on which method might work best. And uh, yeah, this is basically it from our side. And we hope you find some, some ideas here that will help you or you might consider to you. So thank you. Thank you. So this part for me was all the variety of things that you talked about. So uh, it's important to be prolific, it's important to create, it's, it's important not to stop, you know. And, and now that you have this, probably there are some other solutions, and then you're going to face the testing, and the experiment, and see what really works, and what makes sense, and what doesn't. So thank you, this was a nice learning point. Uh, the next team is in group number, obviously, four. So the same problem, they will RC. <laughs> Who is the presenter? So our main presenter is Mara. Yeah, that's my second Thank you. Hello, everybody. Maybe just Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assistant from Germany. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> then we have Radek and Claudia from Poland. We have Josue and Eugenia from Spain. And so here we are today uh, with the other group. Oh. No, I, I said you're Radek. Yeah. Radek, I'm sorry. I'm from Poland. <laughs> Everybody's here. So here we are today also to uh, think about the problematics of uh, sailboat RC. So it's a company that is building remote controlling uh, sailing boats. High handsome boats because they have an international reputation and they plan to keep for a long time. And also, they plan to expand their activity in the next few years to answer the high demand of the high end boats. And so, here with my team, we try to think about solutions uh, because this company wants an automated way for monitoring stocks and facilitate production because these boats are really high end. It's a really nice craftsmanship uh, product with 200 different parts and it can take up to two months to build one from scratch. So it's something really high end. And so knowing that, we tried to brainstorm hard with my team. And so we found some guidelines that we have to follow, which are time efficiency. We need something time efficient and easy to use for the workers because they already have so much work to do. So we want to be easy on them. We also need automation, obviously, because otherwise we cannot save time. And so we conclude that the main goal here is to have efficiency. And to see that on the field, we actually went yesterday morning visiting the company. And so we'll be able to see how they are working right now and try to look more precisely for solutions. Knowing that, and since we are here to try to use the trees method, we went through the really complicated trace matrix and tried to fill the harmony of trace method to find contradictions, which are quite a number of two actually. So it's the time efficiency, we need time, and we need to be easy on the manufacturing process because it's quite complicated. It's really tedious to count each screw by hand because that's what they are doing right now. If I say it well, maybe. And so the thing, the main leads that we found here to resolve these problems are by the number of five. So, you guys. so, first, we need mechanical substitution, obviously. So, the workers won't do that anymore. We need machines to do it. We need some feedback from the system because uh, it needs to be agile and flexible on the, the stocks. We need segmentation because we have a lot of different parts in these little boats and each of these parts need to be uh, controlled separately. We need preliminary action because these parts come from all around the world and sometimes, according to the global climate of the world, we can have uh, stop loss. So we need to overstock sometimes for some parts. <coughs> and then we have local qualities, which is a little bit longer than segmentation, but Actually, the qualities is that we have a lot of different parts, and a lot of them are from different nature. We can have uh, units like screws or things like that. We can have square meters with the sails, and we can also have liquids, for example, with the epoxy resin using the, 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 the whole of the boat. Yes. So, knowing all of that, I will continue. Okay. okay. So, um, as Laura nicely said, we try to export. Um, we had a really nice visit to the company and we tried to see how their daily work and uh, how is the boat making craftsmanship in action. And then what we find out is um, so one of our possible solutions is that if, um, if we can use the different sensors to substitute the menu sorting out and management of each different small parts, then we can save them a lot of time. So here we thought about okay, using substitution from menu visual sorting to weight sensor based inventory management, which means all the all the all the parts will be um, put on shelves with uh, with weight sensors, which means that you can always calculate how much um, how much parts are actually uninstalled right now, and uh, comparing that number to the predefined demand, then you can always get how much you need to order, and this can be done automatically. And every time you take out and put in, then the inventory will automatically change, and no manual labor is required. 
and because we have 200 different parts, so we don't we need not only one scale, we need a array of different scales and uh, distributed in all different stations. I think we saw five different stations dealing with different um, parts and different components, which all need different parts um, of the of the boat. So that's why we suggest that we should have a distributed flexible uh, smart shelves that can be stationed in every single hot station in order to manage all that part. And we also need QR codes on those shelves in order to identify and also for the workers to easily find out where those parts are and what they are. And all of this should be integrated into one information management system. So we thought, oh, this becomes slightly like, okay, building waste sensors is actually quite easy relatively easy, but when it comes to integration of the whole system, it becomes more and more complicated, and we don't want the people in the RC to even take on another project, then, you know, defending the title and completely defend the title. So we just look for possible solutions on the market. So we find one nice company in um, uh, Etern, Eterns, and also a company, Small Shouts, from Switzerland, and also uh, Stock View uh, from the US, United, uh, United States. They all have this kind of offers on, online right now. And the beauty about that is they are they can tailor their system to fit your needs. From managing super small parts like uh, mini brands to huge containers as uh, in tons, they can always uh, they can tailor it to your needs. And the second thing is that some of those companies actually also offers not only the wholesale system, but also the renting option, which means they will set up the system and you can rent it for a while to test it out if you like it or not, or if that actually improve your efficiency or not. So, and besides that, another advantage of using this kind of digitalization system is that it can integrate and uh, it can actually assimilate the, the sales numbers on your website. It can, uh, digit, um, it can uh, dynamically monitor your inventory. At the same time, you can also put in other factors into account, for example, the uh, possible uh, supply chains, um, disruption or other, um, or other problems. And then those can all be assessed in your inventory and then they will put out recommendations for ordering and in um, for example weekly cycle or monthly cycle which means your uh, logistic officer will then be overwhelmed suddenly by you know hundreds of orders per day or something like that and another thing is that those all information can be fit into adjacent component which is the um, enterprise resource planning system, which can manage your resources at the same time. It can also provide recommendation for optimization in the production um, um, production um, processes. Which means you will have in the more your nice monitors that you're going to install in the conference office and also in the station. It will tell you, okay, so what's the what's the work of the week and what's the work of the day. So you don't need to micromanage that anymore. And uh, for more complicated, uh, for more uh, mature products on the, on the market, you can get uh, Scilab or Focus, which is a system which also has a visualization component in it. And uh, if you don't want to go for that and you want to take on some nice project with the students in Split, you can also go for the free and open source softwares that are out there, which means you can also um, have a really fun project with them. <laughs> and of course, so, uh, um, of, of course, like this is our one of our solution. And uh, what trick told us is that we have to think outside the box. So think you from different perspective. So one perspective is how we can make the company more efficient. And the other one is thought about hmm, how can we reduce the work of the company? So we also suggested uh, another suggestion we have is to ask an um, RC to um, take out, uh, bring out another, uh, another, another product, which means that for the for the hardcore players who are really really addicted to the 
craftsmanship and also the competition and also the, those um, those challenges of finishing those fine parts. We can also have um, assemble your stuff out there and shipping around the world. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our uh, that's our suggestion. I have just one question. You slept last night? Yes. Because considering the state yesterday we had, I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed. That's it. <laughs> so, um, and we actually use the solution from our from our um, our nice other team in the first one, who's trying to stay as uh, who's trying to solve the you know stay the high and down problem. So we were staying really high. Joseph, <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice, nice. <laughs> do you have any questions to do any of that or anything to, to add or to mention something maybe to wrap up with this? I definitely discussed it uh, in detail after this. Uh, you and uh, uh, solar solutions are really great and we should be promoted. Uh, I can already say that I'm going to talk that we already were people that did some of the things, so it means we are really right on the track that you know, there's a win win need. Slightly for the camera to see. Too. No, no, that's okay. Are they Of the fish crashes, one of the most important countries in this 
uh, in, in this uh, activity. So first of all, the problem is that polyethylene is the material that is used to in the boxes of transport of fish. We are in a future and we don't know the prices of this material. So we we really need to have a solution to that. And we did a three method. In this uh, method, we find the technical parameters and we find the solution. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> It was perfect. Yeah, it was perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's a couple of nice solutions in the project. So now we don't think you can talk to us about that. They actually I hear that you have a kind of problem with your enterprise because a machine that you use to label your boxes to export the product to the world uh, was broken. So yeah, we found solutions for two of the problems. One was uh, like increasing the uh, packaging price. That's yeah. and the, the other part, the other part is the solution for the labeling device. So we will first go with the packaging. So uh, for, for our first problem to reduce uh, and make profitable to use the polyester in the future, we think we have to reduce this material. So in the first thing, we think that it is possible to use a thinner kind of box like that. We can uh, still continue using this material without losing money. Another uh, solution is to make the product uh, more little. And we know that in some countries, they prefer that they cook the head and the tail of the fish. So we can make uh, boxes with more uh, more uh, efficient in future uses, and the other uh, solution is to make a uh, more profitable, uh, it's make efficient uh, space, so we can make cocktails of different kinds of fish and surface like shrimps, uh, mussels, fish, so in a same space we can have more products. Another one of our uh, solution was if it's a uh, chip, we can use uh, the polystyrene and also material that make the fish fresh, like bioactive cans or uh, different materials like gases or ether. And in the final one, well, uh, we are going also to reuse the things that we think the uh, people don't want, the uh, tails and the head of the fishes to make pate or something like that, because we think everything must be used. And finally, we think that uh, another uh, thing we can do is to reuse the, the boxes of polystyrene. So we can make a circular economy and we can make, uh, in an unstable future, we can make a uh, deficient uh, the fishing uh, companies of Russia independent. This is our solution. That was great. Thank you so much for sharing, us with, for sharing us with your proposal, your proposals to solve this problem. That's amazing. So, Jose, please talk about uh, this problem of your machine that was broken. And because of the conflict in Russia, you don't have the pieces, the, the pieces that, that you need to, to repair the machine. So, we here that you develop a new labeling process for your boxes. So please talk to us about that. So, hi everyone. Uh, so we found a solution for the third problem, which was a problem with the packaging device that was missing some spare parts that should be provided from Russia and due to some political issues cannot be provided currently. So, and uh, together with my colleagues from Poland, France, Croatia, and uh, Spanish, also from France, but uh, Mexican. This solution, we will use a general purpose major engraver, which is used currently for some products, especially for case of fruits or uh, uh, other products. Uh, and with this major engraver, we will put the Packaging iteration information on a piece of yeah, uh, cheap carton, a uh, piece of cheap carton on the package. So we will reduce the use of new papers. We will use reusable and recyclable uh, piece, uh, cheap uh, 
tokens. And uh, we will also use a kind of QR code to give more information to the users who are more curious about the information and the ingredients of the products because this piece of cartoon would be small to reduce the cost. And if we turn up using a kind of QR code and a web service to provide the information, we will get data from users. And this data will help us to do a market analysis and the products that are most popular uh, in the company's uh, inventory. Also, we can make surveys based on the results that we get from the web service and the data server to do a kind of product customization for the consumers. So in return of this product customization, we will get increase in customer satisfaction, which will yeah, increase the revenue as well. And using these pieces of the yeah, cheap reusable cartoons, we also minimize the waste and increase the revenue. And also based on this marketing analysis, we can predict that in which times of the year and in which seasons, in which areas, of our marketing location, which types of fish or food are consumed more. So we can somehow plan a supply chain and also again minimize the waste. And this was something that has been done before in Germany in case of Schleswig Holstein for the bakeries, that they could uh, reduce the amount of waste in bakeries for about 30%. It's just using the data that was showing that uh, in each time of year, which types of bread are consumed more. So yeah, we have a proof of concept for that. And yeah, this is our solution for the packaging problem of the promise. Okay, thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, I think other proposal, other solutions proposed in this uh, presentations, I think it's clear that they are going to revolutionary are revolutionary to solve the problem of the fish market in the world. So thank you so much to you for this such a nice presentation and also to your scientific committee here that make an important part of this work. So I applause for, for all of them. So, um, we to this presentation. Well, we think that in... Um, <laughs> and in an unpredictable future, we need to make Russia independent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, since we didn't have the presence of the company, we started to create a scenario based on the information that we have available on internet. So, uh, to create this scenario, we propose uh, the context what we have. Uh, this is a this is a culture company that has uh, a rules, and uh, to a better understanding, we are proposing like a culture rules a uh, relatable uh, volume. Uh, this is located in the Dalmatian Dalmatian coast, and it uh, consumes energy. And the the sales is like we propose a. Uh, we propose a number of sales, so we propose an equipment that they have and the team that they have. So, what we need? The Chromaris is a company that produces food and that consumes energy, that has a team, that has equipment and technologies, as uh, every company. And the materials for packaging they, they have also. And the marketing that they need to, to, sell, to sell the fishes. So, this is our context and the scenario that we propose to work with this company. So, next. Thank you. So, of, uh, all of us from different backgrounds, no one is in, uh, knows exactly how the fish region it operates. So, the first thing we did was a lot of brainstorming, and this is kind of our mind map. It's a funny drawing, yes. There's no sharks diving in the Mediterranean, especially not here. But we really need to figure out, understand how the system operates, understand what the problem is. That's what we learned. That the most important thing about finding the solution is defining the problem. We defined two, which are actually very closely interconnected with each other. The first is Lack of materials. This is about basically the fish, uh, so the sea bass, they need, of course, food to eat to produce more fish. So, and uh, this thing that Cromarus we think has a problem, this is an extra problem, water agriculture is finding the fish to feed the farm fish. And the other one is, of course, um, increasing prices. Of course, we've got inflation and all the other problems with, involved with that. So, we need to figure out how Cromarus can still stay a profitable company without raising prices too much, of course, so that the product doesn't become not, uh, undesirable. Now we're going to move on here and we're going to talk about one. Oh, sorry, before we do this, to further understand how the system operates and using the trees method, so we, we can use material from the conference, we really talked about also the evolution of our system, really understanding how fish operates. So in the past, as we see the mind map, we had fish that used to be used by nets, by fish boats, it used to be local markets, so everything was sold locally. And it, what we, we called wild fish. Of course, this has changed substantially even in the last 10, 20 years. And we now, most of the fish production comes from aquaculture. So we have fish production, aquaculture, and seafood is now an international business. So of course, for example, in Poland, you can buy um, you can buy shrimp from New Zealand, right? For example. And of course, we all you now we use different systems on the nets with fish farms and other uh, materials using the production. So it's a farm. And we also have to think about the future to find a solution that's sustainable in the long term. We thought about okay, what is fishing going to become? Are we going to still have fish farms if there's not enough food to feed the fish? And it's almost maybe yes, maybe short term, but long term. And you'll see later, that's going to be something special. Fish will become uh, less about the actual animals, but more about the protein. So, we're going to actually have laboratory produced fish. And this is becoming actually slowly uh, it's happening. And um, what's going to happen with other fish is going to become fish. Um, fish farms will become more of a tourist destination rather than a simple industry that's going to be attractive for people to come and visit and fish themselves. And uh, yeah, and, well, this is just something that fish will become even more widespread and we can buy even more fish all around the world. So now we can move on to start two problems we're going to solve. The first one is problem one of the scenarios for the two point six. I'm going to pass it over to you. Oh no, here. <laughs> they asked for the legal advice, so <laughs> the good information for the for the company is that we have now the green deal, and the part of the green deal is the strategy of the European Commission, which is called Part Four, uh, and we uh, advise the company to use the financial support from the European Commission. Uh, because farm to fork is the strategy which the idea is to make a good system which is health, which is uh, environment friendly, and it's fair. So, in our opinion, it might be the, the way to find some financial support for our quite crazy ideas, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And another approach to with a minimum investment in marketing is to be your product as classic. It's classic in a sense that you can allow only a representation of the restaurant in the city, for example, uh, provoking a psychological effect in the others and to make your product more attractive. So you can benefit from that with a minimum invest in your resources. 
So actually we confront here the productivity and the adaptability and versatility of our product in the company. So move on. So for the second product, we have some idea to, to answer to the climate crisis. For example, where should be the tourist sector? They can be a big form. Also the fishing uh, can like a fishing license to train it. The second one, where should be the game sector? This one is a little bit abstract. <laughs> and Michael will explain later. <laughs> and the third, merging with the education center. For example, some some work in agriculture and also some just uh, biological knowledge about fish. The fourth is merged with the green energy, like solar and hydropower energy. We will explain later. And also some alternative product by the secondary product of a fish. And the last one is the recycling no edible fish part. For you for for example, can be used as animal food and also the fish food production. Actually one more solution I was making it too, I could say. The other solution is that uh, quite a good idea is of course that by the way, this is a hypothetical scenario of how the fish farm could look like, for example, in the next 10 years. We have 10 and then 20 plus years. So the fish farm looks a lot more, it looks very different, there's a lot of things added to it. And I just want to start by saying no idea is a bad idea, remember this place. <laughs> yeah, but yes, um, so just point seven is about basically, of course, fish restaurants can actually, uh, the idea is that, of course, just like you have farmland, you can rent, and companies can rent a lot of land, and then uh, just uh, get rid of harvest materials from that land. We actually want to use the same fish farm. So, for example, a restaurant here, uh, say Poseidon and Slit, can, for example, rent this area, this plot, this fish net, and all the fish that's produced there, of course, because, uh, goes to that uh, company or this restaurant. And that benefits both areas because, of course, they save money, I guess, and for the, the actual company, it's an investment from the beginning because, of course, they have to invest and rent this space. So that's a good idea as well. But how this could look, of course, we really want to merge it with different sectors. So we have the tourist sector, so we have like a restaurant out in the middle of the sea, it looks beautiful. We have solar panels, they look very crazy. This would work in the future. Um, we have, the, uh, in terms of the games, it's an idea that um, because everything's becoming more online, the idea is that you can actually play a computer game and if, uh, if you catch a fish, for example, uh, you pay money to play the game, then they, a drone can then send you the fish next day, for example. And these are, we're getting very abstract here, but um, we can also have hydropower from fish. Of course, fish in the net, what they do, they swim, and swim on swim. Usually, if it's a school fish, they always swim in the same way. And the idea is that using that current, we can maybe harness some hydropower, at least to sustain the energy on this, uh, of this, um, Agriculture farms to reduce costs. Uh, is there anything else here? Oh yeah, you can of course write fishing, so that it's very popular. Uh, I'm sure all around Europe, especially in Poland. So you can, you can, someone who likes fishing, they can uh, come and spend, I don't know, pay tickets, spend seven hours fishing, and you know, you, they're guaranteed to catch something, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, but, uh, so these are the ideas. I also just want to say, another thing we can really catch on too much, but there is also the idea of actually producing another fish farm. Well, to feed the fish. So, of course, sea bass is a predator, they eat smaller fish or shrimp. So, the idea is also proposed is to create another fish farm or have a collaboration with another fish farm company to produce food, especially for this fish farm. Today, so far, most fish farms are we catch fish in the wild. Well, so it's a problem to feed the fish in the, in the farm. So, but in the next 20 years, Kamaras, we apologize. Um, we're thinking, okay, what's going to happen in the future, giving our theoretical scenarios? And in the future, actually, we want to get rid of the fish farms as, a, as an idea, in terms of, especially in terms of the closures. We want to create areas where the fish are actually free to roam, so we want to have the fish. And this is, again, it coincides with the EU Commission and law, which we want to have ecological, sustainable food. So the idea is that you don't actually create, uh, have little areas of land, uh, of sea space. We actually purchase or you acquire large sections of sea. And let's say the fish are hypothetically wild, but of course we know they're, they're wild in a much bigger area. So it's like instead of a zoo, it becomes a safari, let's say, yeah? And of course, there's still the tourism sector, we have all the solar panels, but again, the fish are happier and they are free. So the idea is that this is our beautiful fish farm, as you can see, so far they look like this, and we want to get rid of the cubs, and we want to set them free! <laughs>
and there are uh, so-called CNC machines. They are um, kind of um, they can prime, you know, they can make some parts smaller um, so that they would fit in some uh, areas or yeah, as long as the uh, similar shape. Uh, the third idea was to make just one valve uh, that uh, would control two or more pipes. Obviously, that's possible if you have two, two different fluids that are too much different, then we probably cannot, do, to, cannot use it. But maybe in some specific cases, that would be, uh, that would be useful and helpful. Uh, the other idea is, um, I, I personally am not sure about actual um, uh, technical solutions, how does it look, but the idea is there to make flexible pipes. Uh, so one uh, sub idea of this is to make them flexible during the um, kind of, uh, when you are building the ship, you, the, the fragment of the pipe is flexible uh, when it has to go around uh, a path that is too uh, too big from other pipe, and then you cure it, you make it rigid so that it will stay, uh, you know, uh, it will not move when the fluid is moving. And the other um, sub idea of this is to use uh, just use. I'm not sure if you can see, but this is like horseshoe shape. But uh, with you know um, straight angles, uh, just to um, plan that you will be using this in your uh, in your design from the start, right? So okay, so or at least two, two designs, one with the straight pipes and the other with this uh, with the shaped pipes. Um, uh, one idea that is um, not just an idea about a concrete um, ground solution is to design pipes first and then the ship. Maybe if you design the flow. Of the pipes, maybe you could use some some different. Maybe if you look at the design and like, remove the ship and just look at the pipes, that would be helpful in some way. Maybe you would see something, uh, some new ideas, new solutions. Um, so these are all for the uh, for the different shapes of valves. Obviously, because they um, they use different shapes. Um, that um, the design of the ship is done uh, in the computer, um, but the, then if you have to change manually, you know, okay, I have to do so maybe I put one in, in some state that was not um, supposed to go um, or something like that. So they would need uh, maybe database of all the um, all the types of valves, maybe all the places that they cannot go, uh, places they can go for the type of pipes, type of fluids that is in the pipes. And then uh, do some filtering or something like that, so they can get information. Okay, I have this type of valve, so I can use it in this specific space, and this would maybe um, not. Uh, obviously, this will not be. Um, um, this cannot replace the designer, but they can. Uh, they, they, this can help them. So this is for the first topic. And thank you very much. It's the assistant's turn now. Um, I hope everybody is still in high mode. Normally, it is uh, yeah, it's been a long day. So, we're all from coastal universities, right? We all live somewhat near the coast. We all know what a cruise ship or a big tanker ship looks like, right? Yesterday, we already teased the questions what might a cruise ship from the future look like? And maybe the solution for the ship. This is the second question. Maybe it doesn't have to be a ship at all. So in order to wake you up a little bit, I would like to do a little exercise with you. Would you please all close your eyes for a few seconds? Don't worry, your wallets are safe. <laughs> close your eyes and now imagine what for you the cruise ship of the future would look like. Maybe you have some ideas, some opinions on how the cruise ships today work. How they interact with the environment and how they look in your beautiful city ports. Now you can open your eyes again. I think you have a pretty good idea. And now let me share our idea, our vision of the future cruise ship. So imagine you have a cruise ship that is as beautiful and functional on the outside as it is on the inside. It is made with 100% recycled materials, metals, and glass. The outside of the cruise ship is mostly covered in high-tech glass. It utilizes the electrochromatic effect, which means that you have, at the press of one button, you can switch all the beautiful glass surfaces, also individually, from transparent to opaque. This way you can, for example, protect the passengers from too much radiation, too much heat from the sun, and give them some privacy. Or you can make them transparent and let them enjoy the beautiful views. 
this glass also has the integrated um, organic um, photovoltaic cells. So we have fully transparent and flexible photovoltaics. And this means that the ship has also function now in the windows, so it can harvest the energy of the sun both while cruising and while docked in the port. We move below deck now, where the um, advanced um, power systems of the ship is located. We combine more conventional combustion engines with newly developed e-fuels and synthetic fuels on the one hand as a more conventional drive, but we include a hybrid system. So the ship now also has an electric motor, powerful one, equipped with batteries. These batteries can be charged using the solar energy or can also be charged at the dock. So the ship can use its full power systems for cruising on the open sea, while also when it approaches the port, can switch to electric drive purely and have a zero emission um, operation in the cities at the ports without any pollution at all. We move to the ship now that is docked in the port, right? What does it do there nowadays? Probably nothing. It just sits there and waits for passengers and cargo to load and unload. We want to change that. We want to add function to something that doesn't have otherwise a function. So while the ship is stopped in the port, it can be connected to the electric grid, both to get its own batteries charged for its electric drive, but also supply energy to the port or supply energy to faraway islands where it's required, where they maybe was a power outage, it can generate energy from the solar cells or it can give energy from its battery to the local grid. This is called vehicles grid or vehicles load operation. It's already possible in the automotive industry. Why not do it with ships? It would be interesting. And another inspiration we have from the area of bionics, so inspired by nature, we think about um, clams and mussels that live on the seafloor and that um, filter the water around them, gaining nutrition for themselves. Our ship of the future has an advanced filtration system. Once it's deployed in the port, the filtration system activates. And instead of sitting uselessly in the port, it can actually help clean up the water in the port, help filter the water and make the port cleaner, make the beautiful city waters cleaner instead of adding pollution, right? Instead of being something that you don't want in your port, the ship now becomes something that you do want. In your so this can be our vision for, for the cruise ship of the future and what can be what can be done to the, today's cruise ships to make them more attractive, to make them more inviting to have them in your port, right? As some, some collection of ideas. Now the second idea, which I'm very excited about, it starts with a question to you. How many of you have driven an electric car before or have experience with electric cars? So you, for example, what is the what is the most annoying part of it? We are back in the regular. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that's that too. And I would say a second. Of, and the second, the second part is probably the charge, right? Range issues, charging issues. So we're talking about fully electric ship. It makes sense, but it's maybe not so practical because you don't have the capacity, you don't have the range, you have charging issues. What if, what if robots eliminate that? So we suggest that um, you found a new division in your company called Robo Split Marine Charging Solutions. So you already have experience building ships on the one hand, but you also have experience building huge metal structures like the dam from Venice. What if you had both a stationary charging system near the coast so the ships can move from charger to charger along their cruises and um, so they can so they can recharge their batteries and use full electric drive for a longer time but what if you also had a mobile charging vessel that is optimized with big battery packs to somehow follow along the cruise ship in certain areas of the coast and charge it along the drive and this is inspired from the military refuel plants. Probably you have seen these big tankers in the air where fighter jets can dock and refuel without the need to land at all. And we think that an idea like this to revolutionize the, the uh, ship building and, and uh, cruise ship operation market 
could be maybe not building the ship of tomorrow only, but also building the solutions to operate the ships of tomorrow, therefore allowing them to charge along the road as well as cars. And I think that would be, in our opinion, a quite interesting. So, <clears throat> anything to add? Good. Then thank you very much. Yeah. I love this part, you know, we all know that you are so tired, and I'm trying to wake you up, please close your eyes. So, uh, how many of you saw the news a few days ago that the new method for fishing back in the of some shark sheds? Have you seen that? You need to Google that, <laughs> because you remind me of it, you know. Uh, they are using this collide. So basically, they use this collide, and all the pectin is just jumping into the into the line. So they're following line. So maybe you could also use this collide and cruise ship to something. Or <laughs> so we have one group, and we have a huge expectation. <laughs> We're all pumped. So please do your best. <laughs> And we will try not to criticize you. <laughs> <laughs> They're so serious. Are you scared? Was it too much? But compared with your leg, hope it works. So who's doing the first bit? Who is starting? Who is breaking the ice? <laughs> Guy in a nice shirt. So, we are a group with people from all the universities that were here France, Poland, Germany, Germany and also from Spook. <laughs> uh, so, our problem, well, it's not our problem, it's the problem that we want to solve. It's the uh, lack of connection during the non touristic seasons between the Icelands and the mainland. Um, well, I hope that the um, people from the, the course, they consider that yesterday we were recognizing this uh, problem. <laughs> we were visiting some islands and we changed some of the ideas. So, <laughs> but we were working until 9 o'clock, so, well, they must consider it. So, well, one thing, thinking about the tourism method is maybe for the next year, is that maybe they can scale up the problem and don't think about lack of connection. I guess maybe thinking this is a system, a super system is why people don't want to live in the islands. I, I hope maybe for the next year it will be. But this year we want to focus on this. So the first thing that we have done is to think about the list of the of the of our ideas. We were thinking about a lot of ways of changing the transport to the to the islands. Not only the one proposed that it was a tuner or the train. So, so um, basically, we started out with kind of the problem uh, and formulating the problem, and we started here collecting transporting ideas. Here, we just mentioned a few because we all did that kind of. Um, more on the computer. So some uh, ideas on uh, transportation were, for example, to use boats, to use planes, to use submarines, um, to use um, super lines, to use torpedoes and so on. And, and um, after finding transportation options, we went on to the simple strings because um, we decided to make a more stepwise approach. And to really just think step by step and to not lose our creativity because of being uh, um, limited by our own mental um, borders, basically. So, in the next step, we list the possible constraints mostly associated with the weather, so like wind, wave, and the ecosystem, also, especially the marine ecosystem, um, but also like uh, boat traffic or fisheries or already existing touristic boat traffic. 
And the next step, we came up with our own metrics actually. So where we combined the transportation options with the constraints and typically a scientific approach uh, quantifying everything. So we introduced scores starting from one for not affecting at all and five extremely affected. And this year is just a rough idea of the metrics. So we had ships and we're thinking, okay, how much influence does the wind have on ships? So here we label it with the three, because waves have way more influence on ships. Uh, so we like uh, we put there five. And helicopters are yeah. way more influenced by winds than ships, of course, and um, absolutely not affected by waves. So that's how we set up the metrics. In the end, we made the sum and decided for the top four, which uh, didn't uh, which didn't go more up than nine. So the one with the lowest score is the underwater tunnel that we put on the first place. And then we got three ideas all having a mind. These were torpedoes, planes, and drones. At this point, we listed torpedoes at second place because it's not affected by wind. And then we made some brainstorming. So we were qualitatively at this point discussing the options. Okay, what is coming to in our mind when it comes for uh, when we come to the other water tool. What comes into your, our mind when you're talking about torpedoes? What comes into your mind when you're talking about planes and drones? And we listed there everything of all of our thoughts. And the result of this was no torpedoes, because this could be implemented in a tunnel and with this we don't have an effect on the echo recording system. So and the next thing was also no planes because um, the, the wind might be still a problem because the distances between the islands could be um, are actually too huge to say, okay, a plane is really effective with every weather. And then the next thing is can planes actually land? Of course, they're from Canada, the water planes, but still we said, okay, they might be moved on the water tunnel, a better option. So we decided to also combine this with drones. For the tunnel, we make this as main solution because with that we can uh, use transport options for people and islands. It's weather independent and it doesn't have an influence in the ecosystem. And um, there we have multiple transportation options we could actually implement in the tunnel. So the tunnel can be used with cars, the tunnel can be used with a train, like um, having the Eurostar from France to Great Britain. And it can be also, and then we're coming to the implementation of torpedoes, um, use something like mini item hyperloops to transport um, items pretty fast from the mainland to the island or from the island to the mainland back. And all of this uh, we want to support with drones um, because they can be also fast used in emergency situations. They can they are independent, so not um, necessarily relying on human input. And also in the future, they can maybe also transport people, talking here at the point of taxi drones. And now we are coming to some beautiful paintings, which is more symbolizing and more visualization what we are thinking of. One important thing is that we don't need to connect all the islands to the mainland. Maybe we can connect some islands which is other ones, maybe the big ones, and maybe let's think, okay, now from this big one or from this which is near to the mainland, we can do a bridge. So maybe don't think about, because it would be very, very possible to, to make a tunnel from all the islands. So maybe make a Okay, a connection between some of them and then the one with the brain. So, and what we hear from the news, um, that there is already going to be a tunnel plan between these two islands. So, um, we suggested, or our suggestion is to just increase the tunnel system extremely to connect split with three or uh, four 
for ion therapy. And um, as I mentioned before, the tunnel can be used by different transportation options. And to make our inter island connection basically, um, because here the distances are shorter, we can establish roads, especially for island transport. But we have visual lights here. So here we have the sea, here we have the tunnel. The tunnel can be used by transportation so, and also the item hyperloop. So now I'm going to talk about more. Uh, more about the item transport. So the idea is we have a drone dropping the item. This is transported super fast um, to the island or reverse. And there it's picked up by a drone with direct delivery to the people. And also the drones for the future. So taxi drones, they can also transport people. And this can be also used um, as touristic option to make them discover the islands from above. So this will also combine some or have some touristic um yeah advantage to that. Yes. Someone else wants to add something? All right. So um that's our maybe extremely costly uh, <laughs> <laughs> and how to actually solve this problem. Um we have to focus on not affecting the marine ecosystem and uh basically so it's already a, a part of the tunnels planned. And tunnels themselves are also used Europe-wide and across worldwide already to solve issues like this. Um, we thought of this as one of the most optimal solutions there. Thanks. What do you have here? You have me on torpedo. I already had a picture of me flying with a torpedo. <laughs> I would do that. think stuff is impossible or it, it looks like magic you can never do it i would like to remind people of arthur c Clarke, his famous quote any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic so i'm ready for the torpedo let's go <laughs> so uh, this was a really nice thing to finish the Okay. I want to say thank you to everyone at the University of Split and there for all my students and myself. We had a wonderful time. And thank you to all of you because you really made this trip unforgettable. So thank you very much.
So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's it. The certificates are here. We will send you some uh, evaluation forms or whatever, something next week via email. And so please build that. This way we know how to improve, what to do better next time. And we hope to see you somewhere, somewhere next time. Thank you.